Yes.
my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome you this evening. This evening, the Church and Advocacy for a Jamaican Republic and Repatri rep Reparatory Justice Preparatory Justice will be addressed in this month's Health Bond Annual Lecture Series. We welcome you most heartily to this evening's lecture. And we know you will benefit and we know you will be stimulated. We now invite Archdeacon Patrick Cunningham to cover us with God's blessings. Archdeacon. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today, for joining mercies and for allowing us to meet in this fashion to discuss this very important topic in the life of our nation. So we bring before you Jamaica land we love with all its many challenges. And we pray, Lord God, that you will raise up men and women who would lead this nation with a sense of justice, a sense of concern for our people and the well-being of our people. Pray for the church in this land, that the church will be heralds of the good news of salvation and play its part in promoting justice in all spheres of life. And we pray that we may challenge our leaders so that we can be justly governed. We pray for peace in various communities, peace in our homes and in our schools. We present this lecture and pray that in the discussion we may be able to better understand the issue and we may all work together for the betterment of this country as we seek to be a people of justice, peace and love. So direct us in all our doings and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued and ended in you your name may be honored and glorified through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since 2004, St. Luke's Church has organized a series of lectures and forums on topics relating to health, on social, spiritual, and financial issues. You may be aware that our annual lecture is held during October, during Health Month, in our church hall. This year, we are excited to return to its live, in-person format following our virtual stagings during the COVID pandemic. Of course, going forward, we also look forward to hosting these series in our refurbished church hall. What a relief and a joy this is this evening to have you face to face in this place. Thank you so much for being here. So, what does reparatory justice mean? In short, the phrase reparations speak to taking actions to repair or acknowledge wrongdoing and to adjust and to address the harms suffered. Our esteemed speaker this evening will speak on this topic. She will address the matter directly and explicitly, as well as engage us to think about what is meant by Jamaica's advocacy to become a republic. Aren't those perspectives interesting? We look forward to hearing our keynote speaker and she will be introduced shortly. It is Marcus Garvey who said, 
our past shapes our future. It is imperative that we become more aware of our past as we actively shape our future. Indeed, our past shapes our future. As we go through this lecture this evening, our speaker will delineate on the crippling legacies of our colonial past and explore what it means to become a Jamaican Republic. What if I told you that the CARICOM Reparations Commission, CRC, has asserted that European governments were owners and traders of enslaved Africans, instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities? What if I told you that they created the legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans? Do you want to hear more? I'm sure you do. But before we hear more, let us pause let us pause a little um, and invite our sister, Mrs. Christine McDonald Nevers, to entertain us in song. Christine. A bigger round of applause. We know our songster. Good afternoon. I pledge my heart forever to serve with humble pride the shining homeland ever so long as earth abide. I pledge my heart this island as God and faith shall live, my work, my strength, my love, and my loyalty to give. Oh, green, I love the Indies, Jamaica proud and free. Our vows and loyal promises, oh, heart and it is to thee. I pledge my heart this island as God and faith shall live. My work, my strength, my love and my loyalty to give. Oh, green, I love the Indies, Jamaica proud and free. Our vows and loyal promises, oh, heartland, tis to We are drawing closer to hearing from our keynote speaker. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Father Sean Major Campbell from Christ Church, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Father Sean. Good evening, everyone. It is always wonderful to be back in this space and sharing with you. Mine is the pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Professor Rosalie Hamilton is CEO of the Laskochin Foundation since June 2018 and the chair of Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance since 2019. She was vice president at the University of Technology, Jamaica, and was awarded a professorship in the Scotiabank Chair in Entrepreneurship and Development. She established and led the MSME Alliance, a network of small business organizations 
for 10 years. She also established the Institute of Law and Economics and worked as a consultant and a public educator on trade, governance, gender, and other areas of economic and social development. She has taught at the graduate and undergraduate levels in Jamaica and the US. She was special advisor and a trade policy consultant in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, 2000 to 2003, and served as chief advisor to the Prime Minister of Jamaica, May 2006 to September 2007. She's currently a board director for Lasco Manufacturing Limited and the National Integrity Action. She was recently appointed as the honorary consul of the Republic of Sierra Leone in Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome this woman of excellence, the indomitable Professor Rosalie Hamilton. Thank you very much, Violet Morris. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Archbishop Patrick Cunningham, Archdeacon, sorry. Promotion. Um, members of the St. Luke's Church, um, ladies and gentlemen here and online, good evening. It is truly an honor to be here, to be invited to say a few words about the church and advocacy for a Jamaican Republic and reparatory justice. Many in the church have gone silent on the work of justice. These are not my words. <laughs> He's laughing. These are the words of Sean Major Campbell. Father Sean has been a very bold critique of the church and um, a very courageous advocate for human rights and also has been doing a lot of work in the space of advocating for the republic and reparatory justice and so if he's wrong blame him <laughs> um, but i want to anchor the presentation on those words because i think it's worth spending a few moments to reflect on this journey to what he sees and many see in jamaica as the silence in the church today and without trying to provide a comprehensive analysis of the church's advocacy for human rights and justice, I just want to highlight a few outstanding church advocates, apart from Jesus Christ himself, whose teachings guided and motivated church advocates across centuries and across the world. The advocacy of our national heroes is worthy of note. We just celebrated them on Monday, the Right Excellencies, Paul Bogle, George William Gordon, and Sam Sharp, all Baptist deacons, their work speaks volumes. I know Reverend Devon Dick will be pleased at my correct um, salutation of our heroes, the Right Excellencies. Although some members of the Baptist Missionary Society chose to remain silent and argued that slavery was a political matter which should not involve the church, Sam Sharp rejected that silence and orchestrated the 1831 Christmas Rebellion, which led to the Emancipation Milestone in 1838. And as they say, the rest is history. In 1864, in the face of certain death, Paul Bogle and George William Gordon fearlessly stood up in the face of the tyranny and injustice of the colonial system that perpetuated the enslavement of our ancestors even after emancipation, well into the um, pre-independence pre, um, era. These church advocates, among other lesser known church advocates, risk their lives and their families 
to challenge the status quo, to enable us to sit here today, to be listening on the internet, um, and to do so without the shackles of slavery that once tied us to the brutality and inhumanity of British colonial rule. But some of those chains remain through mental slavery and the institutional legacies that persist. They're embedded in our school system that today perpetuates educational inequality. It's there in our justice system that perpetuates an external final court of appeal. And you have to be able to afford to get an attorney to go to London and hope that he gets a visa or she gets that visa to defend your rights and freedom. The structure of land ownership, which perpetuates landlessness, homelessness, squatting, and the demolition of homes by the state, a scene that we've seen repeatedly since our independence. And we saw it recently in Clifton, St. Catherine. And today, more than half a million Jamaicans are living in squatter communities. Our social and economic system perpetuates intergenerational poverty and criminality. And today, we're one of the murder cap capitals of the world. Many of us have remained silent in the face of these institutional legacies that we know lie at the root of the social problems that we see today, that continue to thwart our development in, the, in this country. So I ask, what will it take to break our silence? Are we prepared to risk anything to finally and permanently break these chains, these institutional legacies that persist to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery and to enable future generations to enjoy what we have and more so that they can achieve their full potential in a more humane and just Jamaica. Quite frankly, I think we risk nothing compared to the ultimate sacrifice that our national heroes and others paid for our liberties and freedoms today. So my task this evening is to try to encourage you to take a small step, if you haven't done so already, and I'm sure many of you have, to advocate for Jamaican Republic and reparatory justice. And I want you to think about this advocacy through our own historical lens our own historical experience, not, not the republicanism of other countries. We use these terms and ideas, but we have our own history. And I see it as a 520 year struggle against the injustices and the inhumanity at the hands of the Spanish and the British. It's one story. There's some Jamaicans who don't know that indigenous people are still around today. They weren't wiped out. The Right Excellencies, Sam Sharp, Paul Bogle, and William Gordon, and other church advocates were part of this struggle. And so was the Right Excellency, Marcus Magaya Garvey. He encouraged us to be proud and confident about ourselves, to decolonize our education system, and to pursue self-determination anchored on self-reliant economic development. By 1962, the hope for real change was anchored on the promise of self-government at independence. This was an expression of self-determination, and by 1960, the UN General Assembly resolution 1514 had already established self-determination as a human right. But according to 
Norman Manley. It was important to perpetuate the structure of the government that we had. And he felt that the mission of his generation was to win self-government for Jamaica. And he saw that as winning political power, and in his words, which is the final power for the black masses. That's what he said. And he felt that the mission was accomplished. But today, on retrospect, we know that it was not. Self-government was expressed through constitutional provisions which deeply entrenched the monarch as head of state and centralized executive powers in the cabinet under the control of the prime minister. What it effectively did in my mind was to move from the existing hierarchical arrangement with the monarchy at the top, if you like, monarchical sovereignty, to executive sovereignty. Executive sovereignty is another legacy rooted in the colonial and the post-colonial institutions that centralized the executive power in the hands of the governors. And this was supported by a state bureaucracy that was rooted in elitism. Some of us, our parents at least, were born in those days where if you weren't a certain color, you couldn't even be in the public sector. And their main objective, in fact, their only objective, was to serve the interests of the planter class. That's the inheritance. A strong relationship between our political class and the ruling planter class. The issue of sovereignty was addressed in 1995 by the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional and Electoral Reform. And among other things, there was a bipartisan agreement to create a republic by removing the monarch as head of state. But they said some other things that I don't think we've paid enough attention to. They also agreed to Jamaicanize the new, a new constitution. And you look at the documents. And they also talked about making it a product of the Jamaican people and to rid our basic law of its present colonial form. That's what the bipartisan committee agreed to. But since then, despite the commitments of the two major political parties to end constitutional monarchy, successive generations and administrations retain the old political order and the centralized structure of government remained intact. So today, Jamaica's 1962 independence, independence constitution is still a British order and council, and it's not a product of the Jamaican people. After 60 years of independence, the centuries-old dreams of freedom and aspirations for self-determination remain unfulfilled. So it begs the question, will this move to a republic enable us to break those chains and to fulfill these promises? Will it address the post-independence challenges that we created with politics and the political power in our hands? And it's not just about what our political leaders did and didn't do. It's also what we, the people, did and didn't do. It's about our silence. So I suggest that the republic we want, ultimately, will depend on us, depend on how we choose to shape a new Jamaica. And it's clear that if we continue our silence, we're likely to replicate what we have. 
Now, the idea of the, a republic is somewhat confusing to a lot of people because, as I said, you know, you read about the republic that was created in the U.S. In fact, there's a lively debate even today about whether they have a de democracy or a republic. Um, and so, I think we have... The, the two ways, dominant ways to think about this republic, and I urge that the key concept is to focus on this idea of a republic as a form of government where the nation belongs to the people, where people are sovereign. I think that's, that's where we should focus. We, we tend to ignore this because we assume that, well, you know, the we have a representative democracy. Um, we have a government of the people, reflecting the will of the people. So we don't need to do that again, right? Well, if we look good, it's not quite that. That we know that our parliamentarians tend to go into parliament, and we rarely hear them across party lines advocate on issues that affect all of us. Very rare. In fact, recently, we've been hearing some utterances that align with some of the very critiques we've been putting forward with respect to the changes that are required coming out from bold parliamentarians who are now prepared to buck the system, so to speak, and to criticize the, the executive. And we're seeing it, and it's coming out of the realities that, you know, when the roads need fixing, it's not just JLP or PMP affected. Everybody's affected. So we have to advocate for our people, not for our political um, positions. And so I think that focus on a, a, a government that represents the people ought to be the focus. The, the idea of a, of, of a republic without a monarchy as head of state is an important conception, but we've seen in the republics across the Caribbean the focus on that and the retention of a system of government that perpetuates that centralized approach to government and the related problems associated with it. So what we see is that there's no effective oversight and control of executive actions. We saw recently what happened with this, um, I don't know how to describe it, tsunami of activities taking place in Britain, <laughs> right? And one of them was, you know, you've put an economic plan and a tax package together. This is the executive now. But we can't support that. And the people's representatives stood up and said, no. We're not going to vote for that. That's a, that's a level of... Um, democracy that we need that cuts across party lines, that enables the voice of the people to be heard in parliamentary decisions. And importantly, we need mechanisms in which the voices of the citizens of Jamaica can be directly heard in shaping policy. And so there are two sets of elements that I think are important in this discussion the mechanisms that would enable the people's representative to hear our voice, to understand our will, and to represent our positions as they make law. We need a whole range of constitutional changes, legal changes, policy changes, etc., that can make that possible. So what we have on a regular routine basis, town hall meetings or parliamentary hearings or impeachment, or recall of corrupt politicians, participatory budgeting, where we help to shape our taxpayers' dollars 
to address the priorities that we think are important. Those kinds of changes, I think, are required and must be part of this move to a republic. And yes, we must replace the monarch as head of state. So we have a local head of state that signs our laws on our behalf and has powers that we define in our constitution for such a head of state. When you look at it, it, it really is a shame that Jamaica is the first country in the Caribbean that achieved independence, but is likely to be one of the last countries in the Caribbean and in the world that is going to break this monarchical arrangement. You know, since the death of the Queen, and in fact with the royal visits, there's been a lot of international publicity. One good thing coming out of that is the public education. So Jamaicans are now hearing for the first time that the monarchy and the royal family directly owned, benefited from the trafficking and enslavement of Africans. It's the African, um, the Royal African Company was owned by them. It was a family endeavor, and they had a monopoly for about 100 years, nearly 100 years. Some Jamaicans are hearing for the first time that slave owners were paid compensation. In fact, I thought that was really common knowledge now, but Jamaicans are still hearing this for the first time. Really? They pay them? Yes. And even worse, Jamaicans who went to England and earned, um, worked, and paid taxes also contributed to that payment right up to 2015. In fact, I was part of that. I was a student working in England, paying taxes, contributing to that debt that was taken in order to, that 20 million pounds that was um, used to pay slave owners. Now, the financial benefits of the empire and the royal family is well documented. In fact, Professor Hilary Beckles in his book, Britain's Black Debt, he has a picture of the queen touring a plantation in Barbados that's owned by the royal family, the, the queen's first cousin, um, the Earl of Harwood. And that picture was taken in 1996. So, so, so the we're talking about real wealth, wealth created on the backs of our four parents. At the peak of the British Empire in 1941, um, the British and the royal families' collaboration extracted wealth and devastated the lives of millions of people in 84 countries and territories across the world. 17 of them in the Caribbean. Five are still colonies today, referred to as the British Overseas Territories. So that the wealth that has been plundered from these more than 400 years of British rules, um, as well as the wealth created from the companies and the churches and universities that are all part of it, that benefited, has today led to a global reparations movement. There's a real debt that is owed and it can be quantified and it can be paid over 175 years. That was the time frame of the payment of the slave owners from 1837 with the Slave Compensation Act that legislated this payment to 2015. So it's possible, and I think our new head of state, King Charles, he's inherited much of that wealth, and he's at the center of this debate now. Although his track record and his words in his first speech as king 
doesn't suggest that much will change, but I suggest that there's a glimmer of hope. Just in June of this year, at the Commonwealth meeting in Rwanda, he acknowledged that time has come, his words, for a conversation about slavery. Didn't think we'd live to see that. Has something to do with advocacy? Yeah? Okay, so he says it's time for a conversation about slavery. And he wants to continue his understanding of, quote, slavery's enduring impact. He understands these legacies that I was talking about. And he wants to bring some hope that um, there will be some engagement around that. But I, but I think rather than simply hope, if we want outcomes like reparations, reparatory justice that goes beyond any money calculation but atonement and, you know, um, dialogue and, and so on, we must act. And I think we, it's important that we break our silence, if that's what we want. And we have to actively advocate for change. I think it will take persistent and consistent advocacy to get the outcomes that we want. And the advocacy from the church, as it was in the past, is critical to building the momentum for change. So since I'm at St. Luke's Anglican Church, I thought I'd end by talking to the Anglicans. <laughs> I am reliably informed that you have an awesome advocacy tools. You have a few tools in your arsenal, and two of them I'll mention, the Anglican Alliance and the Five Marks of Mission. So the Alliance, for those who um, are not aware, as I understand, is an initiative of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Anglican Communion, mandated to bring together development, relief, and advocacy work across the Anglican Church globally. The intention is, to, is for it to belong to everyone in the Anglican family, committed to working for a world free of poverty, inequality, and injustice and to give a voice to the voiceless and to, and, and to address vulnerabilities that exist so that we can safeguard this earth. The work is grounded in the Anglican Five Marks of Mission, which includes the mission to transform unjust structures of society. When I saw those words, I said, you have it. That's what we're talking about, unjust structures that have been inherited that we've not changed significantly. And to pursue peace and reconciliation. The Anglican Alliance has been engaged in a range of empowering activities and I noted some advocacy act activities. The migration issues at the UN in New York, child immigration in Rome, climate justice in Peru and in UK, and human trafficking in East Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, Middle East. And I'm also informed that the Alliance has a representative in the region, in the province of the West Indies. And the regional facilitator is Clifton Ned, right, from Antigua. So I want to challenge the right Reverend Gart Bishop, uh, Minot, sorry, Bishop of Kingston, and of course, Archdeacon, we got it right this time, Patrick Cunningham, and all of the leaders in the Anglican Church to add to the advocacy list in, of the Anglican Alliance a couple of things. And I'm going to suggest, be bold enough to suggest what that kind of advocacy could look like. Um, we don't have to start from scratch. You know, the Advocates Network and others are ad actively advocating in this space. It's important to note that from June of this year, 
our Minister of Legal and Constitutional um, Reform, Constitutional Affairs, in her sectoral presentation in Parliament, promised to set up a constitutional reform committee. Have we heard anything about that? Anybody? We're still listening. <laughs> Nothing. We must advocate for the establishment of this committee, as well as information about how the public will be involved in reform in the Constitution. We want to create a constitution that represents who we are and what we want. You know, the Americans have, every American can talk about the first line of the constitution. We the people, our own constitution today does not have any reference to the people. So we need, to, we need a constitution that will reflect on we the people of Jamaica in order to fulfill this long mission of freedom, self-determination. It's the kind of way we want to begin to engage our constitution. The minister also recognized that it's important for public education. Again, still waiting to hear when is the national public education program that will educate Jamaicans about this move to a republic, the role of a referendum. What does that mean? We've never had one since independence. And of course, the important role of constitutional reform. We want to also advocate to table the legislative bill in parliament. Nothing will happen in terms of removing the king as, of, as head of state unless we table those legislative bills. And if we don't want to go into the, our 61st year with a monarch as a head of state, then we need to act now. So we need to encourage our leaders to start this process. It, in fact, it will take about eight months just in terms of the constitutional requirements for us to get to that referen referendum and make a final decision. So we have to start now. And I want to boldly suggest that let's engage our head of state. Let's engage our head of state in our conversation about slavery's enduring impact right here in Jamaica. It's right in. Um, and let's collaborate with the Caribbean reparations movement in seeking a formal apology. We, 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 we ought to have a head of state, man enough and bold enough to apologize in a serious way, take responsibility for this action. It's not going away. Think about it. After 525 years, we're still talking about this inhumanity. And it's, going, it's not going away for one important re reason. The legacies persist. If there was no racism, if there was no Windrush scandal, if there was none of this, we could put this behind us as a sad chapter in our history and move on. But the legacies consist, persist. And so I think we, we need to um, push for the apology, it's moving, it's happening. Repar There's a lot of reparation talk taking place these days. CARICOM has a 10-point plan. Um, let's encourage our head of state to begin to sow the seeds of a better future. Where generations to come can live in a world where there, there are no inferior and superior people so that we can finally and permanently discredit that philosophy and create a world where basic human rights and justice can be guaranteed to us all. The church has a very powerful voice. We have a network of people across every community in Jamaica and quite frankly across the Caribbean. I encourage you to use your voice leverage your network, and end the silence. Thank you very much.
Round of applause. More round. More applause, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Hamilton. And while she was talking, I was writing notes furiously. And I, I just, I, I'm just going to highlight some key phrases that, you know, rang home to me. The executive, constitutional monarchy, breaking the chains of our colonial past, post-independence challenges, constitutional change is required, constitutional for reform committee, a republic where to see it as a form of government where the nation belongs to us. How do we form a new Jamaica? How do we develop a new Jamaica? Another phrase, republic without a foreign head of state. Is that something you want to think about? How about no effective oversight? Is there effective oversight? Voices of the citizens will shape our country's policy or should shape our country's policy. What about participatory budgeting? That's a phrase that provides lots of food for thought. Our speaker also spoke about the colonial legacies which persist. She spoke to wealth created on the backs of our four parents. How about that? Emphasizing that global reparations movement, a global reparations movement has been formed. And what is the role of a referendum? And then, you know, I, I smiled when I heard this, the marks of mission. Is that familiar to all of us? Huh? Um, um, Henry and I work on a, on, on a certain committee and when Henry reminded me that it is over 10 years that that particular concept was launched within the diocese, I really was surprised. I really had to think hard, is it that long? But it's something for us to think about. Do we know there are five marks of mission? Do we know what they are? How can we expand and effect the marks of mission. And then we heard about um, using our voice. So there are lots for us to think about, to chew on, and you know, to use our voice and use the audience that we have access to. And so while you think, I'm going to invite our sister Christine McDonald Nevers to come again and help us to relax a little bit as she sings for us. It's a hard road to travel and a mighty long way to go. Jesus, my friend, Going to meet me by the way I know. Many a lonesome valley, many deep waters roll. It's a hard road to travel and a mighty long way to go. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, and there we wept when we remember Zion. By the rivers of Babylon, where we
mighty rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, there we wept when we Thank you, Christine. Ladies and gentlemen, do you think that your coming here this evening was worthwhile, was worth it? Absolutely, absolutely, it really was. We want to just thank Professor Rosalie Hamilton once more, and now it's your time to talk with her, to hear from her in a more intimate way. And so we invite your questions, and we'll, as we take the questions, we'll invite Professor, to come forward and to respond. Um, you can use the mics, or oh, um, the mic in this passageway right here. So uh, please, no rush, no rush to the mic, just one at a time. Please. Thank you so very much. Good evening. We have a question from the online audience, and I hope I pronounced the name right. Shamali Golding, Shamali Golding asks a question for Professor Hamilton. Jamaicans are hesitant generally to participate in the electoral process, namely voting, and usually one of the most effective mechanisms for the voice of citizens to be heard are referendums. However, with this high level of apathy on the part of many Jamaicans towards voting, do you believe that referendums will be an effective mechanism for the voices of the Jamaicans to be heard in a republic? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I take the view that our ap apathy is not static. It's not fixed. In fact, if you look at the voting um, history, you know, we had at some point in our history up to 80% voter turnout. Um, so the question is, what will it take? Now, I, I, I think it starts with the conception of ourselves in this democracy. Do we see ourselves as owners of Jamaica? Do we see ourselves as belonging here with rights and responsibilities as owners to determine our future? Or is, are, we, are we conceding that others have that right? And I think for, for many of us, most of us that have grown up on a system in which we've been dominated and others take action for us and tell us what to do, we've kind of accepted that as the norm. So, so I do think it starts with a reorientation of our minds. And I think if we get to the point where we see that Jamaica belongs to us, we have a right, we have a say, um, we spend, we work hard for our tax dollars. This is why I like the idea of participatory budgeting, because it's our money. Yeah, countries have gone to war fighting over the right to determine how your money is spent. So, so I think once we begin to see ourselves as owning a piece of this rock, uh, then I think that begins that process. Now, it's not a simple issue of going to the polls and voting. It starts before that, engaging a political process so that who you're going to the, votes, the polls to vote for is somebody you want. We ought not to accept a political system in which people are put in these positions and our representatives don't come from us, the people. And we hear all the rules, we know all the rules that allow the political parties to place candidates, especially in these safe seats. We've accepted these as norms, they don't have to be. And I think it's when we begin to challenge that and say we have a right to determine who should represent us. And we have to actively support that representative. One of the things that Jamaicans don't want to do, for example, is to 
provide financial con contributions via tax or some other mechanism for our politics. We don't want to pay for it because we think it's so corrupt. So who is paying for it? Somebody's paying. So we have a system in which we don't take responsibility. We assume magically that we will get the outcomes that we want by just kind of wishing it will happen. It won't. And I think if we look at our history, we're where we are today because of the active decisions to fight to change a system that didn't represent our will. Thank you. There are two more questions, three more questions, two from Gloria Gascon. And you may have touched on it before, but I'll repeat her questions for the benefit of the room. How could we get our people in a referendum not to vote for a party, but what is good for the country? And her follow-up question is, will participatory, participatory budgeting prevent favoritism in the spending of people's taxes? Okay, so two issues there, the budgeting and the matter of the referendum. One of the reasons why I think this idea of public education is so important, and it's not just what the government does. The government obviously has resources and can do a lot more than any group. But I urge the church to be part of the public education process. I urge the universities and all of us to actively get involved. Because to get the outcome we want, where we don't go to the polls and turn it into another political exercise where we vote a party line, we have to convince ourselves. We have to tell our friends, our family, and say, listen, this is not what the, a referendum is all about. These are issues that affect all of us. This is not a political outcome in any simple way. And in fact, we've suggested through the Advocates Network in our press releases and in our engagements that this is a great opportunity to unite the nation, to take the nations to a poll where we vote on an issue both parties agree to. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> both political parties are campaigning across party line let us have a local head of state. Let's not turn it into a political battle because you simply reproduce the problem as we move to a republic. And I think those are the kinds of things that we have to do. We can't, it won't happen magically. Uh, uh, um, so I say that. And with respect to the participatory budgeting, now, you know, these are not, none of the suggestions I've made or anybody makes in terms of what this republic ought to be is a panacea that will solve all our problems. It won't. Yes, we can get um, party political shaping of participatory budgetary outcomes, just like what we're just talking about with a referendum. Again, it's what we want. We're not automatons. We're not mindless people, right? The, the Jamaica, there is a huge middle ground of Jamaicans who are silent. And if we wake up, Jamaica changes. There's a fraction, if you look at the poll, the last poll, we're talking less than 40%. Let's split it, 20% on either side, <laughs> right? This is where the bulk of Jamaicans are, right in the middle, not persuaded by either political party. Make your voices heard. Shape the outcomes you want. And I don't think that the outcomes are inevitable. Good evening, Professor. Tyrone Sam Resini. How are you? I must say that being here this evening means a lot to me, very much so. But there's just two points. Bear with me. I'm not a microphone person, so when Norman Manley made that speech about political independence, he went on to say that was the charge of his generation, but he's charging the next generation for economic independence. You think we'll ever get to where we'll to be an economic independent in Jamaica? If we 
economic independence. The people won't destroy people like a shark. You like what happened down in the countryside here, they bulldoze these people out. When, if and when we become a republic, you think after that, we, we, we start to live as a better nation, between love and harmony with each other? What do you think? Thanks for your answer. My answer is, it depends on what we do. There's no magical outcome. The republic we get is the republic we shape actively. If we remain silent, we'll get a republic that looks exactly like what we have. If we choose to act differently, we'll get a different outcome. If we want to settle the matter of land ownership in Jamaica, where we deal finally with more than half a million Jamaicans squatting, we will get a different outcome. These are not magical decisions, you know. These are policies. We put in place decisions, decisions about how we spend our money. And if we push, we make our voice heard, it can happen. So that would make your work and work of people like you much harder. But you have to continue to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Hamilton, thank you very much for your words. Well thought out, well organized, but you know me, and you know that I don't just simply agree. You know I always have a point of view on things. And amongst my friends, I am known to be an anti-reparations man. In fact, we have a close group of very close friends. And we have agreed amongst ourselves that we won't use the word. We'll call it the R word. We won't go further than that. And one of the main reasons I have such a very strong objection to it um, has to do with the way we think, the way Jamaicans think. Let's put it that way. And we were put on the right track from as long ago as the 20s by Marcus Massa Garvey. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. And recently now, in popular song, Bob Marley came along and used those words and popularized it. But we have not grasped that lesson. And the reason I feel so, and what you have said, what a lot of the things you have said, I agree with, is correct. That's, and the issue of the monarchy is something that ought to be changed in the, in the appropriate time. And the same thing with the issue of reparations, it should be dealt with in a different way and appropriately. Now, if we approach it the way we're approaching it, we are doing nothing more than perpetuating the, 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 the reliance, the, 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 the dependency syndrome. I say we need to stand on our own two feet and use the things that we have been given and prove to the world that we are worthy and we are independent and we don't need anything from anybody because, and I speak specifically in relation to Jamaica now, Jamaica has been given all of its wealth which existed after, and I agree, the extraction by the colonial powers up to the time they left. So we have all of those things and we have in large measure mismanage them. There's one outstanding exception, and that is the University of the West Indies. The University of the West Indies is a world-class institution. So having said all of that, Professor, 
I wish to ask you a simple question. Do you think that the course that we are now taking, the reparations um, movement that's ongoing, the CARICOM movement and so on, is the correct one? Because you're, all you're doing is making a bad situation worse. All right, so my answer to the view, I've heard it, and I don't fundamentally disagree, um, because I certainly stand on the side of Marcus Mugaiga Garvin and all of his teaching, teachings for self-determination. I think we can walk on two legs. And I'll say it this way. If we look good at the main proponents of reparation, not the modern one, way back then, the Rastafarians, what did they do? Were they sitting back waiting for reparation? Or did they actively create a world in which they could live in dignity? Bob Marley is the best advocate for that. He didn't sit around waiting for reparations to create a new music. He created his music. All the advocates I know, and I've engaged them around the same argument, because my view is we must focus on creating a world for our people to address the fundamental problems we have today. That must be our focus. I'm very clear about that. Yeah. But I'm also clear that there's a debt owed. Um, and it's so clear for us because that debt was paid to the wrong people. It was quantified, it was paid, um, and so it's fair to say we, you owe us that. But I'm also clear, which is I say we have to work, work to, to run on two, two legs, because if they don't pay it, we, are, we must be focused on creating a world along the advice of Marcus Garvey along the path to self-determination that is not about anybody else's business but ours. It's about how we lift ourselves up from wherever we found ourselves. The reason I make the point about um, the two, two legs is that, and why the reparations call is not going to go away is the perpetuation of these legacies. Because the more you continue to do this, the more you remind people of that past. And I suggest that if they did not exist and we had a level playing field in which we could lift ourselves up, we could do it better than most. And most people will say, forget it. Let's, 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 let's build our nation. But that's not where we are, and I think that's why the call is there, and I suggest we must walk on two legs. But that is why we should change it. We, we shouldn't be talking about it. We should change it, like Bob Marley has, and the other musicians that have followed behind him. We change it. But I'll go to the other aspect, the, 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 the monarchy. The, the, the Queen of England has no place being the Queen of Jamaica, as we now stand. But because of the same mindset, the people of Jamaica do not wish to change it. And it is not going to change until the people decide they want to change. Absolutely. And it comes back down to that same malaise, the head, yes. the mindset. Yes. So until we address that, yeah. no government is going to successfully change it. Yes. What do you say, ma'am? So, no, I agree with you. I absolutely agree. That ought to be the focus. The focus ought to be on the um, mental slavery, emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. That message has been repeated time and time and time again. And I think we really actually ought to spend time. In fact, I've advocated within the whole course at the university, what exactly does that mean? What exactly is mental slavery? Oh, the mental slavery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thought, you know, so we, we need to study it and understand it so that we can know how to lift ourselves out of it, to build that self-confidence that we absolutely need to create a world. 
I thought you were referring to the emancipation yourself, emancipate yourself from it. Yes. But I was that, that's what I'm saying. Say what it is is things like paying your taxes, pay your taxes, participate in um, programs in the church that will benefit the community, marks of mission, yes. actively participate. Yeah. Poor Henry is like pulling teeth and, and my good friend over there to get people to participate. The Jamaican people don't see it as their role to come forward and do these things. And the question I ask is to, of you is what do you suggest that can be done to change their mindset so that they will own the country? They will, build, they will say, I pay my taxes yes. because taxes help. I have one answer, education. One answer. We have right to, answer. absolutely. We have to keep talking, keep dialogue, keep educating ourselves. Thanks to social media, marrying the fake news, we, we're getting a lot of information out. All right, my confession as I start is that I have not intentionally sought to educate myself on anything either the pros or the cons about Jamaica as a republic so yes I got a lot of information here and of course being alive and moving about you hear this here you hear that there and so on so whilst you spoke quite a bit on um, the governance aspects and the represent representational aspects and the focus on we you know, we the people, that is a big part of the focus here. So, are there benefits to being part of the Commonwealth? So, for example, I've heard, and I, as I said, I don't know how accurate or not it is, but so, for example, if there is, if, God forbid, we were to go to war, then we know that we would, it's an obligation to, to send aid. If we have major disasters, there is that obligation. It's almost, no, let me not say guarantee, but an obligation to send assistance for the head of the Commonwealth to send that assistance. So those things obviously would directly affect the economics of the land, meaning um, we have our, when we have the flooding here, the flooding there, and oh, we don't have enough money for this, we don't have what, 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 and there's not enough in the budget, the allocation is insufficient, etc., etc. Are there any benefits on our present status, which, or how would you address people who have those concerns as reasons why? They say, boy, you know, it's like, okay, I move out, but I know I still have my parents home, so if things get hard, I can turn there for some help. So how would you address that and in the context of notwithstanding A or well B. <laughs> well, you know, you use the analogy of our parents' home, you know, if, our, if we grew up in a home where our parents abused us our entire life, denigrate us, beat us, just humiliate us, would we still want to stay? So that's one way to think about Fine. that mm -hmm. idea of going back home um, and leaving our home. Those benefits, people have asked about those benefits. I'm still looking for them. I'm literally actively trying to find the benefits. Let's be clear about aid. Aid is provided by the countries who can afford to provide aid, regardless of your status of, um, in the world in terms of whether you have a head of state or not. In fact, just this week, the information is out about the role of the visas, right? I think there was an article done last week that everybody saw that, right? So Jamaica is the only country of our 14 countries that are still part, have um, the monarch's head of state that requires a visa. Guyana, who left the monarchy from 1970, now gets visa-free access to Britain. So let's be very clear, aid is politically determined in a world in which um, geopolitics matter and it's not just about humanity. We've seen it time and time again. And so if there's a strategic interest in providing assistance, the country will get it. I think that's just the reality. So I am searching and I actually would love to hear those benefits and I'm sure one may find one or two but I think the price we continue to pay 
with the same points that I think Vinny just made about this lingering dependence. Because we have a head of state, we can somehow, even if it's imagined, benefits we fall back on, right? It's just perpetuating this thing. We have to be bold enough and self-confident enough to know that we can make ourselves our way in the world. I want to say this. A lot of people are fearful about this republic because they use the bad examples of what we've done so far since independence. We've messed up. In fact, let me quote one of our political leaders. The political parties messed up, right? That's what Bruce Golden said to us. So, so yes, we've messed up, but that's not who we are. We're not just politicians who move up, messed up. We are scientists, we are um, top world-class athletes, we are you know, creative musicians, we are the best of Jamaica is yet to be seen. I am very clear about this. And I know that because in those inner city communities up and down, uh, down Jamaica, we are killing the potential of our people. The creative potential is being stifled. So, so I am of the view that if we create a society that can unleash our creative potentials, the best of us will shine. And it's not the corrupt politicians or business people, it, um, by the way, it's not just politicians don't corrupt themselves. They're business people who corrupt them. And we don't talk enough about business people who are engaged in corrupt practices as well with our politicians. Civil servants who are also corrupt, who we, we, we somehow forget when we talk about, when we point to these politicians. That's not who we are. And so I think we need to shift the idea that somehow the worst of us is going to come out with our Republican move. It will happen if we do nothing. It will happen if we are silent. It will happen if we don't actively fight the majority of us in the middle actively fight to create a different Jamaica. Noted. And this is just an aside because of your comments regarding fine, you know, me using the an analogy of you leave your parents home and you say, but if the home was this traumatic place and so on, um, what it brought to me was there's good and bad in everything and we have, um, and well, background. So as a member of the Jamaican Folk Singers and the work we do and the research that we do into aspects of Jamaica's folk music culture. So we recognize, yes, our past, all we went through, but we also recognize that our, that we made it through. We made it through that, and that has made us who we are as a people, as Jamaicans, yes. right? And so that resilience and that ability to, to laugh. So we have our survival yes. techniques we could list a whole long thing. So it just Absolutely. brought back to say there's good and bad and oftentimes it is in, our weak, in the weaknesses or the struggles that we really show our strength or our strength and power is developed. So in everything, the good and bad, we can apply our minds to, take, to use it to better ourselves versus so that's an aside it had nothing to do with what i had asked you before just an aside it's, it's an important aside it's an important aside because you've really pointed to two tracks that have brought us here today we have a track of conformity and perpetuation of the status quo that many of us chose since emancipation remember you know some of our four parents went back to the plantation they decided that they can't survive outside of the planet. They, they accepted the beating and the um, inhumanity as a choice. But many left. And many actively fought for a different society. So we have these two tracks. And we have to decide which track yields the best outcome for us. And we just have to look at our history. And I think where we are seeing gains is when we build a track that follows the 
the, the, the self-confidence of a people who can shape our world in our own image that defines who we are. That's the story of our musicians, of our creative people, of our athletes who chose not to go to the US. Remember, that's what they did to become the best, the fastest. We, we, we honed them right there at the University of Technology, Jamaica, initially and eventually at UWI. We are producing the best athletes in the world. At independence, we could not dream that would be possible. We did it. So there's no limit. We just have to be bold, have the sense of confidence that we can create a Jamaica in which we run things. And I mean it by that, we Jamaicans who can create a society in which the best of us can survive and thrive. Professor, thank you for an excellent presentation. Excellent. Do we have your permission to use the presentation sure. in other fora as we discuss as clergy and, and as a church? Sure. Question. Are we as a people too dependent on government in the same way people are dependent on the monarchy? Hence our apathy and we don't have the desire to go forward and be independent. That's the first question. Second question, what will Jamaica look like as a republic, a Jamaican republic separate and apart from other republics? Okay, so the first question, are we too dependent? I would say yes. <laughs> I, I would say yes because I think that we have grown up on a system in which um, for many of us, the opportunities and realities of making it outside of the system was very difficult. If, if you look at the scheme of things, everybody tries to get a government work because it's safe. You know, you're not going to get fired. And in fact, with all due respect to hard work in civil servants, I know you exist, um, so enough respect to you, but you can, don't really work and still get pay. All right? So we know that. And the truth is when you look at the data, the best and brightest of us leaving the university ends up in government. That's the data. So, um, how do, we, how do we shift that? Again, I think it comes back to this self-confidence. We, 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 but importantly, um, that activist spirit that says we want to create a society in which, yes, we can make it outside of working with government. The reality of why almost half of our population have left over time, successive migrations since independence and before, it's that lack of opportunities to make it outside of a system in which we, um, what they call it, um, political spoils and, what do you call it, things and spoils. <laughs> Scarce benefits and spoils dominate, right? And so much of our reality is shaped by political reality, political connections to get things done, you know? So until we sh change that, many of us feel stuck. And it accounts for a lot of our silence, you know? But, but I want to urge, I see a lot of my peers here over 50s. <laughs> I like to talk to my peers. You know, we have one place going. Many of us have made it. You know, we, we, we're comfortable at this stage and phase in our lives. Let's give some good trouble, <laughs> you know, let's, 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 let's push for our children, many of them struggling every day just trying to make it, and they, they're not willing to buck the system, but many of us can. The second point was, remind me, 
thought Jamaica looked like as a republic. What's yeah. what unique I, about Jamaica as know, opposed you know, to other republics? I, that, that re, re, I, I resist that question all the time because I know people want you know, a, a list of what we should have and so on. I, I, I say it this way. My standard answer is what it will look like is what we create, is what we do. Now, we can move from that to say, okay, what is it that I would like to see? And I can say to you, well, you know, I'd like a structure of government in which, for example, instead of appointed senators, we have elected senators. So we can get into that kind of conversation. But I, I think the question is, why? Why would we want? elected versus say appointed and it's the work to understand that to get involved to engage the conversations that really will make us want a certain outcome and fight for it as opposed to just tag along because people like me say that's the, the way to go you know what i'm saying so I, I say that to say that there are many parts of this republic that speaks to the structure of government, governance, the broader swat of social and economic changes that we need. And every one of them requires a kind of engagement with the society. Look at the education system. We've been talking about it for so long. And so a, a, more, a, a more granular answer, I shouldn't say granular, but a more fleshed out answer would be uh, a society in which the, 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 these social and economic issues that confront us, that are in our face, the crime problem, the education problem, the infrastructure and, and land issues that we're seeing blowing up now, et cetera, et cetera, can get resolved. And resolved in a way that's fair and equitable. So the devil then is in the details. How do we get there? How do we agree? And so it's, this is why this kind of conversation is very important because we have to compromise. It's not all that I want. I will fight and I will push and I'll say this is way. I, I, I've, I've been spending a lot of time saying to Jamaicans, let's think about this republic, not simply about the king or the queen. Quite frankly, the, queen, the king is very happy. He's about to be coronated. He's inherited huge wealth more than all of the countries in the Caribbean put together, right? It's not so much about them. It's about us, it's about who we are. It's about what we're prepared to fight for. And I think when we begin to focus on those issues, we have to ask ourselves, I should ask you, what kind of republic do you want? And what kind of republic are you prepared to fight for? I think that kind of engagement is what we want. Thank you, hi, Prof. Um, very engaging, very, very good presentation. And I, of course, have fond memories of you in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. We go way back. But I'm coming at you, Prof, as a lecturer and student of international relations and having worked with you on trade negotiations in the past, to, to take you back to the reparatory justice side, how do you break that out? Um, and you know well that the ask that you have has to be a negotiated ask. British taxpayers look like you and me. It's a very different UK a very different notion of the us versus them. So just to ask you to break out in for us, and that may be a whole different lecture, what, what it is that, what is the ask in a, in a more defined way? What is it that you would want to, 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 to gain from the legacy of hurt and the disquiet mm -hmm. and the dispossession? Mm -hmm. All right, so before we get to the money part, right? Um, the Reparations Committee have talked about this process starting with an apology. 
And I think there are two important elements before we start to talk money, before we do any calculation. One, accepting that what happened were crimes against humanity. The UN has designated it as such. Let's start there. Just accept that it does. And if you accept, take responsibility. Now, if we take responsibility, and this is where I may leave a lot of people, because I think if you take responsibility and you just stop doing what you continue to do today, I'm fine. I don't need to go further down it. A lot of people disagree with me here now because some people say, yes, I want the money, right? But if you allow me and the people I know to w live in a world where you're not systematically targeting us to limit our capacity to create a world in which we can live in human dignity, I have a problem. And I think if you can do that, we don't get to the money yet, you know. If you can do that, I think you've solved at least half the problem. Right? Because the world continues. And again, what, hap what is happening, still happening in Britain, is a reminder, win, rush, scandal is a reality. It's not settled. And you still have systemic racism in the institutions in Britain today. I mean, we're seeing it all over Europe, in the US. So I think for me, the idea of an apology where you take responsibility and a process in which you commit not to do this again. <laughs> you commit to stop the, the legacies, the, the perpetuation of these abuses, and you commit to not do it again. Then we can move on to the conversation about what is affordable, if you like. <laughs> but you know, financiers will tell you that, you know, we can find elegant, mathematical formulas to project, you know, how to pay the sum over a period of time and so on. And I, and I don't think that's an issue. And I'm, I'm not worried about, for example, the idea that somehow that huge sum of trillions of dollars is now going to impoverish people today. It won't. Um, we've, the world found billions of dollars to deal with a COVID pandemic, unbudgeted. We found it. So if we really want to deal with this issue, we can find it. So I would say that process of reparatory justice, the conversations, as I said, it's a glimmer of hope, but I do put some weight, even if it's not much, on the idea that the king is wanting to understand those enduring legacies. We can start there. Start with this conversation. Because perhaps when he understands those levels, remember, most of us don't understand it, you know. Most of us do not understand the enduring legacies that persist today. Let me remind you that it took the police officer standing on the neck of George Floyd for Jamaicans to realize and to learn that we have a governor general wearing an insignia with a white angel standing on the head of a black man. We don't know. We perpetuate these institutional norms. So I, I, I think it's a process and I think we can engage the process. And again, Vinny, I take your point. I don't disagree with it. We need to keep our eyes focused on the um, self-reliant capacity to build a nation, whether we get reparations or not. A final question from the online audience. Again, Ms. Golding asks, what would you say to persons who are hesitant to remove the monarch as they, forgive me, 
corollary, corollary. Yes, Carly. thank you, the Privy Council, because they do not see a better fit in the CCJ as a final court of appeal. Hmm, all right. <laughs> That's always a very difficult one there. Let me say this. Um, you know, one of the conversations, and I've tracked this conversation of the Civic um, Privy Council since I was in law school, and I've written about it. Um, and one of the things that struck me recently is that when we talk about justice in England, and we talk about the justice in the Caribbean, we hear about, and in Jamaica, we hear about corruption, and we hear about, you know, unfairness. But we never hear about that. There's, a, there's a, an assumption that justice in the Privy Council in England is uncorruptible. Now, does anybody believe that today? We, we've seen what has happened with the recent head of state. We see what is unfolding right now in Britain. We saw what's happening in the US, including what happens on the court in the US, a very politicized institution. So, so the idea somehow that we cannot create a justice system that can deliver justice, that can be fair, is really an indictment in all of us. It really says that all of us are not good enough. That's what it says. And so I, I, I think it's just part of the conversation we need to have to build the self-confidence, to create the institutions, to um, become self-reliant, to create a society that we want. I just want to make one comment on what you have said about the Privy Council yes. and whether issue of justice. One of the arguments, and I support it, for the continuation with the Privy Council is that their judgments are consistent, they are predictable. When I just started to practice in Jamaica, I could predict what a judge would do 99.9% .9 correctly. The only difference is going to be the facts. Otherwise, the law is applied consistently. And that is the difference, and that is what gives people some concern. The consistency in the legal rules that are applied. All right. And I just quickly say that we are only 60 years old. The British has had a long history of creating that consistency. One of the things we forget in the British history is how in settling this matter of the monarchy, they cut off Charles I's head, had him walking up and down London on a stick. That was part of that history, right? So they've done what they had to do to get to that point. We are just starting. And I, I think to, to compare us um, with an institution that's hundreds and thousands of years old is not fair. <laughs> so I, I do think that we have to build, we're going to make mistakes. I hope we won't cut off anybody's head and walk around um, Kingston with it. We can learn from the past and that we ultimately can create a ju ju judicial system that we're proud of. I have a chance. Professor, I, I worked with the Constitutional Reform Program in the 1970s. And I've been to many, many town halls all over Jamaica. And one of the things I was happiest about is that the, what we could call the average citizen would sit in those discussions and question and talk about the Constitution. And a lot of them bought copies and read them. I'm saying that to say that I think that the issue of being a rep a republic is not one that is above the heads of the normal man. Absolutely. I have that hope. Absolutely. My big concern, though, is that in recent times, I'm hearing the, the thought expressed that we should collapse that referendum with other items. And I'm strictly opposed to it, because I think what we'll be doing is whitewashing the issue. I'm hopeful that if we get a real strong debate about what a Republican um, government could mean for Jamaica, that we'll be making steps in deepening our democracy, because that's where my concern is. Yes. 
And they have, so I'm asking the question, am I a little paranoid in being concerned about this idea of collapsing the vote for changing the government or, or, or you know, a form of government to a Republican, collapsing that with other issues? No, man, you're, you're spot on. Um, I think you know, there is also the argument that, you know, it's cheaper to put them all together rather than to... Listen, it's worth it, Jamaica. It is worth it to bring this country together. One issue, one nation. We should push because just the experience of going to a poll where the two political parties are telling us the same thing. They are Jamaica. Remember, you know, 30, 27% of Jamaicans still want to hang on to the monarch. So there is a debate, right? And there's a whole set of people in between that is undecided. But they're not lined up on one side or the other. So we should singularly focus on that. I absolutely agree with you. Singularly focus and to convey the idea that it is worth it to unite this nation. Thank you. I expect the applause to be more resounding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the start of, of the conversation at St. Luke's. It's not the start of the conversation nationally. It is the start of the conversation here at St. Luke's. And remember, we can use our voice. I want to recognize and thank our audience here, all of you here, and those online via Facebook and YouTube, as well as recognize our sponsor, Lasco Distribution, through its brand, brands, iCool Water and iCool uh, Drinks. So just thank you, Lasco, for your continued support. Let's give Lasco a round of applause. They came on board when we asked. And they continue to support St. Luke's. Ladies and gentlemen, I, we have had quite a discourse. And I want to invite um, Dr. Elaine Cunningham to come forward and say thanks to Professor Hamilton. So, Dr. Elaine, please come. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to, I don't know if I will be able to do it well, but to thank most profoundly Dr. Hamilton for your presentation, but also the way you navigated the questions. And where I was sitting, where I was sitting, I was not able to see a frown on your face as you just, you just spoke with lots of love and passion. There are many takeaways from your lecture this afternoon, but one of the takeaways that will go and live with me is a phrase you said, self-determination is a human right. And I think that's where we have to start in order to change our mental sets, our mindsets, because self-determination will facilitate self-confidence and that will help us to break the silence and to become less detached from what is happening around us and to sow seeds of advocacy which we need, which our church at some point was very involved in, the Anglican Church, but we have lost the love we had. And so, thanks again for stirring up that love, for sowing the seeds of advocacy in our hearts. And we are very grateful that you have given us permission to use your lecture to 
sensitize others who are not here. And as our chairperson said, we shall be acting. We talk a lot in Jamaica, but the actions are few. And so you will hear from us what we have done as a result of this lecture. And then they invite you to come and stand and uh, right here so that my swan sister, daughter of the former Archdeacon, Archdeacon Stone, will present you with this beautiful orchid. Thank you, Deaconess. Thank you, for so you much. Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you very well, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Tone roof. It's all good to have you here, and um, we thank again Professor Hamilton. Of course, we have to um, remember um, Father Sean, Sean Major. Now, I reached out to Father Sean by WhatsApp, and he responded and gave me some excellent articles, which are long, Father Sean, so I have to, you know, have to digest them, think about them. But it absolutely is a pleasure to have you both and the audience. I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry Chair. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was so mesmerized by Professor <laughs> that I, I, I just didn't even see Father Sean. Father Sean, thank you as usual. I know that you would have been here given the nature of the, <clears throat> the lecture and we thank you for the role that you're playing um, in advocacy for human rights and justice. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Christine for the appropriateness of her renditions this afternoon. And to our dear, bestest international streamer, or techie, call it. And lastly, I'd like to offer thanks to the chairperson who um, was a who chaired the program this afternoon, and we are going to just remind her now that it's supper time, so we will not tarry too much longer. But we want to thank you, Nola, for the job you have done, and thank the people online and those who participated. Very, very, very pleased that you, you sent questions. So, Prof, Sean, Christine, Carlet, Nola, and all of you who are here, have a good afternoon, and thank you. Come home, it's supper time. We invite um, Reverend Kemar Prendergast to come forward and close in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for life. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us this day. As we depart this place, we ask you to bless us throughout the remainder of the night and guide us safely home. We ask especially for your blessing on Professor Rosalie Hamilton, who led us in this timely discussion. We pray that the learning and the conversations of this gathering will not die after we leave here, but instead may we continue to contemplate and be advocates of change in our communities, parishes, and country. Enlighten our minds and give us the strength and courage to fulfill that which is desired of us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And friends, just before you go. Yes, Father. You are invited, if you have the time, to join us in the boardroom for some refreshment. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm inviting those who have the time to join us in the boardroom for refreshment. Don't want you to leave without enjoying our hospitality. Father, we'd like to have a group photo, and uh, so we invite Prof, Reverend Sean, and Father Sean, um, invite persons here to the altar. We'll
for the lecture. <laughs>